Welcome to the Executive Lounge, the business leadership program that brings you nuggets and insights from the captains of industry, men and women who have scaled the daunting hurdles of managing and growing enterprises in different sectors. Today we're joined by a creative entrepreneur, an actress, a producer, and a director, as well as a philanthropist. Juliet Ya Asantua Asanti started a movie career at a very early age in a big budget Hollywood movie, Deadly Voyage. We'll get to meet her to learn more about her today. Welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you. So, Deadly Voyage. Yeah. You were a star at a very early age, you know, when everyone was you know, hoping to probably make it onto our version of the silver screen. Mm -hmm. You were already starring alongside Omar Epps and Co. Yeah, I mean, it was a great experience. I, I went for audition just like everybody else. Actually, I was lucky. I just come from another production, you know, um, because I'd done something small on his, his Better Bidi Akun. And um, the well-known Veronica Kwashi, I mean, I respect her so much. And Vero had seen me on TV and invited me to Takrade um, to go and do a Pius Familia film uh, called Twin Lovers. And w as soon as we came from shooting Twin Lovers uh, in Takrade, I heard that there was this audition going on. My goodness, it was so scary because we had all the, the big names and I just started, right? And... Um, the role that I was auditioning for, a lot of people were auditioning for that role as well. And so I went in, I auditioned, um, they came back after a month and, and, you know, my name was called as having gotten the role. And it was very satisfying, a really great experience. I can imagine. I yeah. see the glint in your eye. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to come back to that experience. Well, let's backtrack a little bit right. and start off by getting to meet Juliet the girl. What was life like as a child? You know, a bit about your family, where you came from and all that. Hmm. I had a very interesting childhood. So... First of all, my grandma um, was one of the first uh, police women in Ghana. Um, and she, at some point, she stopped and then she became a trader. She went to Liberia and, um, and invited my parents to come to Liberia. I had just been born just around that time, so mm -hmm. they went with me <coughs> and um, had the rest of, you know, my, my family kind of grew from there. And so I grew up in Liberia, actually thinking I was Liberian. Wow. Um, and came to Ghana for the first time in 1987. Um, well, when I say first time, first time as a conscious um, uh, kid in 19, I wasn't so much of a kid that I was around 13 um, in 87. So growing up in Liberia was very interesting. Uh, mind you, this was before the war. And Liberia was definitely the place to be. I mean, my family, you know, was doing very well. It was a beautiful childhood. I had some challenges. At some point, I was ill. Um, and so that also came with its own challenges. For about two years, I couldn't walk. Um, and so that came with its own challenges. But, you know, I have really fond memories of Liberia. Now, as a child, you, so you went through this period where you couldn't walk. Mm. Uh, basically, you were crippled for some time. Right. Do you remember what was going through your mind and, and did you have the will and desire to walk again at some point? I did and I must give credit to my mom. I mean my parents um, didn't give up and, and that I must always, I, you know, I thank my parents for that. My older sister uh, would go with me because, you know, they couldn't find what the problem was. So we just basically went from town to town from hospital to hospital first we tried the hospitals they couldn't really tell what was going on uh, because you know it just happened suddenly um, I woke up one day and I just couldn't move um, the only incident that w I remember before that was I, I tried to play basketball and I fell um, and then I, there was another fall I was on the as kids, we used to call it seesaw, <laughs> you know, where you sit on there and they That's push right. you. Um, but it was nothing drastic. So that was the only incident I remember before. Uh, but then when it happened, I just woke up and I couldn't walk. And they took me to all the hospitals. They couldn't find what the, the problem was. Um, and so I started to use the wheelchair. Uh, they took me. So they started going the traditional medicine route because the hospitals couldn't help. And, you know, we would go from one traditional healer to the other and it wasn't working out. 
and interestingly i think because of that it also triggered a, a other problems so i was still peeing in bed you know i was seven um eight and i was still peeing in bed um and obviously when we went to places um the treatment wasn't that great um you know there was some starvation and, and a few things going on until my parents thought you know what this is it and they brought me back home into the city um and that's where actually uh we met another traditional healer who, who was from ghana by the way interesting um and she pretty much just walked to our, our home and said that she could um you know do something about it and and she started the process I remember vividly that she would use all these herbs on my on my leg and after a while about six months I started to move a little bit and you know it just went on from there and finally I walked Wow mm. I'm sure that came with some great relief uh, for your parents and it for, did for you as well. it did I mean to have a, a potentially <laughs> disabled child for life I wasn't born disabled and I was always a strong vibrant kid running around i was I'm, i was a child you would call stubborn you know basically so even when it started and i started complaining they thought it was one of my antics you know it's like uh Munja, you know, one of her antics but then they realized it, it was serious and my dad recently told me how at some point i sat down for so long that i started kind of you know my back started caving in um and they were very afraid that that would have been it but you know i'm grateful to god and i think i've said on the show before that when you've sat at one place and not be able to move um when you see people running and you can't run when you see people walking and doing stuff and you can't do it when you start to do it you now appreciate in a way the little things in life and so pretty much i started walking and running and i haven't stopped wow that's mm. great so as a kid you fell playing basketball you fell yeah. off a swing um you couldn't walk for a couple of years eventually you could what about your upbringing do you think you've taken with you um, to the Juliet we all now know? Well, I would say not giving up um, because in my mind, all those years, I never gave up. I mean, I never saw myself, quote unquote, as a disabled child or as a cripple. Um, of course, I used a wheelchair. As I started to get better, I used the crutches. Um, I did all of that, but I always knew um, in my mind that I would walk. And I remember vividly that I would have dreams or I would daydream of me running or flying or whatever as a way to mentally escape my physical limitations. And I think um, that's a habit that I've taken to where I am because I don't see obstacles. I just see head i don't i don't see barriers i see obstacles and so when i come across something that seems impossible i would take a step back and think okay what's the other way around it because for me i know that at a point so many things several times in my life it's been said to me this is impossible you can't do this and i've proven to myself um through the help of god of course that i could i could do it so for me um this is it till i fall down and, and and die this is it it doesn't exist for me well that's interesting let's look at your life um after school mm. so you set up ego productions mm -hmm. um you produce a number of tv shows mm. uh, and your current movie silver mm -hmm. rain um, um has been selected i think you made the final um of the african movie uh, yeah 2015, 2015 ambca we were right. we were nominated best film in africa that's right and, and i think that's the first the people's choice award right well this wasn't the people's choice okay, award so there's a like jury an yeah jury. this is a, this is that was their highest award and i think um no one has has been nominated for that award um in ghana before and so for me it was a privilege it was a very high contested category uh, we didn't make it uh, but you know once you're nominated it's like you're a winner because you're up with the stars already That's and right. for me that was my first 
feature just by myself and it was my first um, trip to the AMVCA because I'd always I was busy doing other things and for me to go the first time as a nominee not just in any category but in the highest category of the evening I think for me it was very satisfying and I hope that um, it brought a lot of respect to Ghana as, as a reputable film filmmaking country well, I like the sound of that, but it hasn't always been rosy. No. Um, you have held it together for some time, but mm. there have been ups and downs. What are some of the um, darkest moments of, of, of this journey? Oh, my goodness. Um, we, we could have an entire <laughs> program just talking about those. So um, I just would say that as an entrepreneur, first of all, um, I, I respect, there are quite a number of people that I really, really respect mm. around the world. And within Ghana, I always say that we don't have a lot of mentors, but there's someone that I really, really respect. I've never met him. I haven't been lucky enough, but from afar, he's been a, a big mentor. That's Pastor Otebel. And I used to um, go to, to Baden Powell, and I remember that there was this particular day, um, and I always kind of... Um, identified or felt drawn to the bird, the eagle. And so I remember um, those days, Bidin Powell, I went to church, there was this day and he, he preached this entire, I think it was a series on the eagle. And I was like, I remember sitting at church and thinking, okay, my company is going to be called Eagle Productions uh, because, you know, go read about the attributes of the eagle, uh, strengths, uh, riding the storm, seeing very far. All of those things were things. For me, names matter mm -hmm. a lot. And so um, I picked the name and it's been quite um, a challenging uh, journey. You know, I mentor at MIT in Massachusetts um, and at mentoring at Legatum under Sloan Business School. And what I always say to my mentees is I'm a steady in failure, right? You mm. can steady me for everything not to do as, as an entrepreneur. And I've gone through the phases. I mean, at some point we employed almost 50 people depending on the projects we we did um we could employ 100 or 150 at a time and i've been through the stages of of various ways or various models of of running an organization being an entrepreneur adapting to situation failing coming down um so i've been through all of that and everything you can think about that an entrepreneur can go through from lack of financing to employee issues to lack of skill sets to just attitudinal problems and uh, market challenges and all of those things I mean I've been through uh, but the most important thing as an entrepreneur is always to step back um, and look at what is going wrong and I always say that in as much as I never give up uh, it's important in the journey to know when to to quit is also an important part of the learning process and learning also when to take a step back when you're almost at burnout and I think those uh, couple of things, including knowing when to say no, um, a few of those things, I think. And I think getting to the point also where you know and understand yourself and your strengths better, I think is very helpful. So, yeah. You've held it together through all the ups and downs. You've drawn inspiration from um, Dr. Tabil's teachings. But what about you? Mm makes Juliet want to continue to keep pushing boundaries. Um, I mean, you've shown that you can be innovative. Mm. You start a mobile flicks, um, which is essentially creating um, content, content for the mobile, for the mobile and phone. also distributing content. Exactly. Mm. Uh, and these are things that are very frontier uh, mm. ideas. How are you able to generate that mm. kind of uh, innovation and, and be creative and be at the forefront of some of these things? Well, uh, first, not being able, not being afraid of failure. Actually, I embrace my failures because I know that it is from failure that we learn. That's one. Also understanding that everything takes a lot of work. So for instance, um, I'm excited to say that we just premiered um, Silver Rain Digitally on MTN just uh, on Valentine's Day. 
and someone watching the process might think oh she's just done this I've been almost working with MTN towards this for almost five years if you go onto mobile uh, onto the MTN uh, play platform my content and the mobile flicks has been there for almost five years but then you see it now and you think oh this is just happened um, even the movie I did I was working on it for over 10 years and so you know I started this business I started working and, and doing business when I was 17 um, and so just um, knowing that everything takes time and being patient with the process and being trusting of myself so I'm not afraid of failure I'm not afraid to 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 hit the ground <laughs> my bottom has been on the ground before so I'm not afraid to hit the ground and fail I'm not afraid you know there's a phase that I love that you know there's a phase that says that one thing I know for sure is that I'm not God and so also knowing that I can put in as much as I put in but it might not work and being accepting of the fact that it might not work mm -hmm. when you accept those broad frameworks or those broad strokes of possibilities I think it frees you so when I'm doing something, I'm not under any, uh, you know, cloud that this must definitely work. If it doesn't work, I'll make fun of myself. I'll go back, I'll relook, go, go back to the drawing board, look at it. Um, I always, uh, I like to work with great people. I've been lucky along the way to meet some really great people. I have a great team right now. I've had some really terrible people work with me. I've had people steal my ideas. I've had people just um, work against you. When, but that's all part of the learning processes. And I, and, I, and I always say that I don't regret anything that's happened to me because it's made me stronger. And so I get into a situation now and I'm able to, I remember there was a time I, I say this story uh, in New York and I was practically homeless in New York I just finished school I've gone to one of the best schools I just come out of school and I was in the space of thinking what do I do with my life and putting things together and, and things just started going wrong one after the other and I was stuck in New York with my suitcase luckily my daughter had gone to school so she was out of the way and I was stuck in New York with my suitcase and five dollars in my pocket and being able to survive that almost sleeping on the streets right like sitting down for day to break sitting down and pretending everything is okay and day breaks and I'm, I'm I have a have a degree I'm not like you know and I have a company and, and and I have a family and all of that and being able to take that um and not knowing anybody nowhere to go and just being able to sit there and bear that and actually even comfort other people who are sitting on the streets with me and being able to pick up myself and, and go on to the next day and then things change that just tells you that if you hold on a lot of people give up just when their 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 break is about to come mm. so for me it's always how how much more can i hold on and and can i take it one day at a time and and I know that my break will come and if I hold on more and more one day at a time the break always comes interesting mm -hmm. stuff you've just said you know um, that at the point where you find yourself at your lowest mm. you're able to uh, find reason to keep going mm. and also the whole idea of being patient mm -hmm. and working through things right in all of this there's been some personal tragedies we'll look at that when we come back from this break you're watching the executive lounge with me in Shirado. Welcome back to the executive lounge with me in Shirado. We've been talking to Juliet Ya Asantua Asanti. She's the CEO of Eagle Productions and she is an actress, a producer, a director, a philanthropist and your general troublemaker i'll <laughs> call that a creative entrepreneur so julie before we went off to the break we you know kind of taking a walk through your life mm. uh, you've overcome uh your own personal challenges um not being able to walk at the point um and since you were able to walk and run nothing has stopped you since mm -hmm. but that's not the only personal tragedy you've had to uh, endure um 
Generally, people tend to, you know, go through life, find love, and you did find love at some point. At some point, yes. And then one day things just went south. Yeah, massively. <laughs> but um, it started going south um, for, for a while before it finally went completely south. I must say it wasn't a completely bad experience because I have a beautiful... Uh, this year, 16 year old. <laughs> wow. uh, from that, yeah, so I was married. Um, the marriage didn't go well, and so we broke away. Uh, when the tragedy happened, we actually had been divorced for almost two years, even though a lot of people thought that we were married. So at least the good thing is I'm not a widow, right? Um, we kind of divorced before it went. But he was a great guy, one of the greatest people I've ever known i mean we were friends um we were great friends and i think that helped take us through the most difficult times and towards the end i remember saying to him that um kojo you have to be strong for our child and i remember saying specifically to him that i know i know the there's nothing that anyone can tell me the worst thing that i wouldn't know about you i know the worst thing about you and i know the best of you and so uh, you should be strong for our child. Unfortunately, um, he gave up. Um, and, and, you know, I want to use this opportunity uh, because later events and my own education, I want to use this opportunity and platform to talk about the need for, for proper mental care in this country. Um, you know, when you, when it's very difficult, first of all, there's a stigma that goes with being uh, diagnosed uh, with having mental issues and mental issues can be on many levels from de depression, uh, even if it's bipolar or whatever, to other forms of mental illnesses, to the more serious ones. And unfortunately, we don't have the facilities. There's a stigma associated with it. And I must say that at the time, I didn't necessarily think it had anything to do with mental health. I just thought there was something very wrong with the situation. And as you say, I'm an artist. Maybe I'm a troublemaker. So if I'm in a situation, the finger always points to me, but not necessarily so. But he was my friend. He was a great man. He made a lot of mistakes. Um, some of them may have been driven by an unhealthy mental uh, situation. Um, so, you know, myself and my daughter, we've forgiven him. We, 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 have, we have expressed our love uh, to him many times, wherever he is. And we've moved on. And uh, my daughter looks exactly like her dad um, and, and, you know, carries a lot of his attributes. And I see him in her every day and it's it's been a great blessing i must say so when you found out that your ex-husband had taken his life mm. how did you feel well i knew him so well that when events began to unfold i predicted what was going to happen but again no one would listen and I remember making a lot of calls and no one took me seriously and saying, putting things together, I know this individual, I know this man, and, and no one would listen to me. Um, and people have lived with that regret. I'm happy to say I didn't live with any regret because I knew that I had done the best that I could and we were friends um, till the very, very end. In fact, um, I was the only one he wrote to. Um, twice. I mean, he, he did a, he wrote a letter, he, he dropped off the letter in the morning of the incident and he also um, added me to a handwritten will and actually even got a family member to sign off. Um, and so I, I must say on this platform, I didn't attend the funeral because there was a lot of hand pointing and a lot of victimization going on and everyone wanted someone to blame and I was the easy person to blame and you know later on in life i even heard you pass somewhere and they would go like uh do you know she killed her husband and i'm like well for one we weren't married for two it was a very open self-inflicted act so i'm wondering 
you know, did I fly to do it? Maybe I'm called Eagle <laughs> Productions, so maybe that was one of my flying moments. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we spoke almost towards the end, and I could tell. So for me, when I finally got the call, uh, I remember driving to pick up my daughter, and I was crying the entire time and saying, he's going to do this. And my friend telling me, no, he's not got the guts. He's not going to do it. Juliet, you're dramatic. And I kept saying, I know the man. And if someone would just listen to me for one minute. Um, but, you know, again, back to my point, we are not God. You know, I know that I'm not God. And I know that I don't carry responsibility for, for things. So, I mean, what will happen will happen. And there's an ultimate plan for everything. And I'm just glad that... God was kind enough to leave me a beautiful daughter um, from, from him. And so a part of him is still here. And, and I think um, the universe, God understands why. And I'll leave it at that. Right. Mm. Let's talk about work. After all of that, mm. you put yourself together. Mm. You've done a series of TV programs, mm -hmm. done some production work. The Ghanaian industry. Right. Are we there yet? No. Um, but we are getting there. I mean, I'm excited to Why say... Why are you optimistic? Because, you know, I've, I've been... I'm one of those people who've been... Maybe there's a Methuselah, or there are some Methuselahs of this industry, and probably can be counted. I mean, if you think about when I started this, I'm in my 40s now, and I started this when I was 17. I've been there, done that, you know, been on the wave, see it rise and fall, and I think I can see a certain direction. Unfortunately, um, we, you know, I wrote a story and, and at some point I'm going to produce that movie where I kind of in the picture depicted how we were moving backwards because our heads were turned backwards. It was an art piece and we were moving backwards and actually thinking we were moving forward. And I can actually even connect that to the entire nation or entire Africa. I'm not going to go philosophical. And it's interesting because when Brexit happened um, and there was this artist that did this piece of Britain with a human being going backwards mm -hmm. thinking they were moving forward. Um, and I thought, ah, this is so apt and art is interesting. And, you know, when you think about something and, 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 and somebody also thinks about the same thing. And so for me, that was a great representation. But um, having done my film, I then came face to face with the many challenges and that is what led me to actually start the Black Star International Film Festival as a way to tackle some of those challenges. Mm. And for me, I always want to see the cup as half full rather than half empty. And I mean, we opened submissions for the first time last year. We had almost 4,000 submissions. We had 3,400 to be specific, 450 to be specific. And... Um, just seeing the number of people that were eager to come to Ghana, just seeing the exchange of ideas. I mean, in the room, we had a lot of panel sessions and you could hear the crap and you could also hear the really great thoughts that were circling. And, and even industry reaction to the festival between last year and this year, I think has changed tremendously. So we've moved from a point where people are like, oh, whatever, to a point where people are actively like, when is this coming? What can I do? How can I be a part of it? And I, within even that space, I see a transition. Um, and I think there's the awakening to the potential and opportunity of this platform. I mean, whenever I speak about this industry, I get emotional. And, and I think that people are misunderstanding the impact of this industry. We are who we are because of our culture. And our culture is influenced by, by what we see. And, and, you know, you talk about great nations. And great nations are great nations because of soft power. And soft power is gotten through the spread of culture. And culture is spread through the arts, whether it's music or film or news or whatever you want to call it. And so when I think about America, before I went to America, I saw America as powerful. I even saw it as maybe potentially somewhere where you walk, the roads are made from glass and people don't, you know, do so, some things. And you f get there and you find out that there are worse places, slums in America than there are in Ghana. 
how there is in Ghana. And what gave you that feeling? It's probably because talking about myself and, and my age, maybe I watched Rambo or Chuck Norris. Somebody else may have watched something else. I listened to Beyonce or I listened to uh, artists that I love. Um, and, and I think and they, they, they speak about their countries and they speak about the great things and they show great images. And these images impact us without us understanding and knowing that they impact us. You listen to CNN and there's a certain um, agenda. I'm not saying it's negative, but the, the main agenda is to sell you know, sell their, their, their markets positively. But all of these are orchestrated by people who sit, you know, in uh, the industry mm. and people who sit in the space where they formulate policy. Mm -hmm. Where have we missed out on setting that kind of agenda? Because we have a rich culture. Right. And if you would go back to Kwame Nkrumah, you would remember that, mm -hmm. you know, culture was a big deal for him. Mm -hmm. The orchestra, the uh, arts uh, a center was built for, for some of these things. Right. Uh, I think it was a Ghana Film Company and right. all these things. So there was an agenda. Right. Have we lost our way as far as I these think we are did. I think we did. How and do we get back? Well, first of all, I think as civil society, we need to recognize, you know, anytime I talk about film, people just brush it aside. People feel, first of all, there's this erroneous notion that you enter into the industry when you don't have anything else to do. And so I remember people, people have always told me, someone even told me, won't you find in, in our local language, won't pay people, pay being yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, why are you doing this? And I felt it was sad. And so you see that in a lot of the countries it's a conscious thing either policy frames it it's a national agenda you have i mean for instance uh one of the the embassies that one of the institutions that supported the festival last year was gothe institute gothe institute is the cultural arm of the german government and it's gothe institute is in almost every country pushing the culture their culture they are engaging. They show a German film every week. People go watch it, understand Germany. Uh, Berlinale, which is now, uh, I think, the second largest film festival in the world, is one of the biggest foreign exchange earners of Berlin, of Germany. Um, it exposes the culture. It, 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 you know, you should just go there uh, every year uh, between January and February and see how vibrant Berlin becomes because of Berlinale, which is a film festival. And, and so you see that it's something that is being driven. Gothe is a governmental institution. It's being driven uh, by policy. It's being driven by framework. But here it's like put on the periphery. I, I, I hesitate to say that even when um, over the years, and, and this is not to say uh, to, to even... Um, target any one government but you think that even when they are choosing their their people to head ministries and all of that you even feel that more thought goes into other sectors than when it comes to our sector is almost like okay who can do tourism and who can do arts oh okay you don't have anything to do yet huh why don't you go there i kind of almost have that feeling and and then it, it, it almost when you when you see what happens it, it is it's like a joke and it all saddens me. We've, I mean, South Africa has gotten the memo. Nigeria has gotten the memo. And how is all of this playing out? Well, what are the what are the uh, uh, the upsides that these nations have shown because they understand? Because the they got the memo. My God, it's incredible. We are a nation with such high unemployment rates. If you look at when I did my film, within one two months, I employed 150 people. This is a, a very low-hanging fruit. Put the, uh, uh, the employment creation aside. Look at, you spoke about me being in Deadly Voyage. What was the budget of Deadly Voyage? Recently, we had Beast of No Nation. Beast of No Nation, which was a very low-budget film, was $6 million. That's what they spent in Ghana alone. Imagine if we had even two, three productions happen here annually. A typical Hollywood budget can go into the hundreds of millions. So imagine if there was a national drive to, 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 to attract filmmakers to come and co-produce in this country. Do you know how much foreign direct, investment, uh, you know, foreign direct investment that would bring into this country? The employment, it would create the, the skills transfer, the equipment, uh, all of those things. South Africa 
has a conscious policy. They've signed film treaties with many countries. Africa, only one film treaty, I think, with Kenya. So South Africa, if you go shoot there as a foreign uh, uh, producer, working with a South African producer, you get almost 25% of your budget back if you hit over $100,000. $100, so you can imagine everybody, the traffic is moving to South Africa. The traffic is also moving to Nigeria. We have very stable um, uh, uh, structures. We have a stable economy. Why can we, when I was growing up, um, you could have two or three productions happen here annually. So if every budget, every production comes with even $5 million or $10 million or $50 million or even $100 million. Recently, Captain America was, was partly shot in, 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 in Nigeria. The budget was over $100 million. So you can imagine, if we are able as a country to go out there, aggressively attract uh, a, a foreign uh, a direct, you know, attract co-productions to come into this country and shoot how much money will we be attracting and you have to put certain incentives that's what south africa has done put in incentives nigeria is doing that uh going after collaborations that alone what will it bring to this economy just mention how many sectors can go out there and just so easily in quotes attract that kind of investment skills transfer create such employment uh, and all of that and bring such attention to the country i mean i've i've been watching on cnn lately in the last one month thailand is going out and selling thailand made in made in thailand products all sorts of products and suddenly i was i didn't used to be aware of thailand and all of a sudden i'm, I'm seeing all of these amazing things come out of thailand and, and what could we do to attract more tourism into our country? The beaches, so many things. I mean, all of these things are connected. When we did the festival, over 70 countries participated. Ghana government, uh, we had a struggle. I mean, I was everywhere last year complaining that we didn't get enough support from the government. But what? Gothe, which is a German government uh, institution, stepped in and paid for all the African countries to come to the festival. They all slept in hotels. They all ate. They bought stuff, you know. So what does that do for tourism? So all of these things are things I call things low-hanging fruits. And these things are very low-hanging fruits that we can tap into that I feel we are not. We're going to take a short break. And when we come back, I will be getting into Julia's head. If she had to run the creative and tourism sector. What do we need to change practically to pluck some of these low-hanging fruits? This is the Executive Lounge with me in Sherado. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Chira Addo, and today we're talking to Juliet Ya Asantoa Asanti. She is the CEO of Eagle Production, an actress, a film producer, a director, a philanthropist, a creative entrepreneur, and of course a troublemaker. I like that part. And so we're going to make some trouble um, for very good reasons though. Juliet, you talked about low-hanging fruits. Mm -hmm and that if we want to cure this business of unemployment or if we want to stimulate the flow of uh, money through our economy, we should probably be looking at the arts and uh, a conscious effort at streamlining processes and policies that allow us to draw more of, of these things in. But from where we sit right mm -hmm. now, what do we need to do to be able to get to the place where Nigeria is attracting Captain America and South Africa is seeing a constant stream of production work in their backyard. Well, um, again, you, you spoke when you were, you were, when you were uh, asking the question, you spoke about the intersection of all of these things. So I would say that it's not just one thing, but it's a combination of things. Um, let me just backtrack a little bit and take it back to education mm -hmm. and who we are as a people. And I say this because, um, of course, I've written extensively. I also write for the Huffington Post, and I've written extensively on this subject, that I think that as a people and who we are and where we are going the education that we have itself is is not suited to where we want to go as a people when i started this conversation i i mentioned how 
I grew up um, in a different country at that time. And I think that part of the reasons why I am who I am is because of the education that I had um, from the beginning. And part of that education also included taking the arts very seriously. And so I always say to my friends, listen, when people um, say, take their kids to learn music or to play uh, uh, sports or to ride a horse, to do all of these things, to appreciate art, what does it do? It makes you a more holistic individual. Um, I remember um, speaking with a very respected individual in this country, um, the CEO of Daylight Financing, and we were having a conversation about the different parts of the brain and how one needs to develop the different parts of the brain. And I think that we have to do two things. We have to relook at our education, look at how we can incorporate the arts and how we can grow the individual as a holistic individual. And I, this might sound controversial, but I think that our educational system was designed for a different set of people. It was designed by our slaves masters for, um, maybe for slaves, I don't know. But um, a friend once told me that, listen, if you have a houseboy and they start to think, you have a problem. You don't want them to think. You want them to reproduce. So if I tell my houseboy, go to the market and buy me this, I don't want him getting there and getting creative and thinking, oh, I could buy this and buy it. No. Buy what I want. Bring it to me. So you think our education has actually, as someone put it, it was meant to create clocks. Exactly. Civil Robots. Service. I mean, we need to be innovative. We need to take risk. We need to be creative. We need to understand that failure is part of the process of growing. We don't have that. We need to be risk takers. We need to try new things, innovation. We need to, I mean, now, even technical, when I did my national service at a poly, poly or wherever. I mean, now you don't even hear about technical schools and, and all of that. I mean, I mentor at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of, of Technology, and you see that's the bedrock of, uh, you go to Silicon Valley, that's where innovation takes place. Look at all the apps we use these days, from, from Facebook to, to, to LinkedIn to Babel to whatever. We have young people in this, country, in this country that are creative, innovative. Are we pushing them? No. Are we giving them the tools? No. Are we giving them the opportunity? No. Are we, uh, you know, nurturing them to stand back and create? No. So these are, it's all part of this, and I think that we, I hope that the present government will take some time. Um, the minister designate, I know him personally, I know he's great, he's passionate about this. I hope this is something that will come out, that the entire education system needs to be redesigned. Who are we as a people? We are just reproducing. My daughter schools out of this country, unfortunately. The first report she got when she left this country, by the way, she was attending one of the best schools here. The first report, she's not an independent thinker. Mm. So everything she wanted, um, uh, you know where you want someone to kind of give you the, the nod that you've done a good. So everything she'll go to the teacher, everything. Why? Because here, you cannot be independent. You cannot be creative. They would say you are disrespectful, all of those things. So that's the first. Two. We need to be aggressive in how we, we sell ourselves. You know, people tell me all the time, I post things, I'm a very social media people, uh, um, social media person, and they go, you talk about yourself too much, huh? You push yourself too much, huh? If I don't do it, who will? We know what, what we are. I, I spoke earlier about Thailand selling themselves. We need to go out there, sell what we have, attract people. You know, you need to go out there, go to Hollywood, go to the studios, get them to come here to produce, put in place policies that makes it easier for them. Take, you know, tax breaks, let them bring the equipment. When they bring the equipment, they are not going to take it back. It's going to help our industry. Skills transfer. When I did Silver Rain, I brought in a cinematographer from South Africa. And what he thought, the, the, those who worked on the, on the camera, from the focus puller to the camera operator, incredible stuff. When we went to South Africa, we took money there, did we not? So if people come and shoot here, will they not bring money here? 
all of that when they come they sleep in hotels they eat they create employment skills transfer we have a situation where those who are coming out of schools the gap between what schools are teaching and what the job market wants is very wide how do we close that gap how do we make it more practical we are doing the festival we invite interns we have someone flying all the way from germany to come and intern here pays their own fare pays everything and we have young people here we've given the opportunity to come and intern to volunteer and they think they are doing us a favor so even that spirit of interning of learning from people of respecting our our elders and learning from them from our elders also understanding that you can plant a tree and not necessarily have to enjoy the shade you know i have people who are competing with me today who should be teaching me I mean, I don't understand this. People have issues sharing who they are and what they are. So it's an attitudinal problem on many levels. So you're, kind of, you're ad ad advocating that we overhaul the way we teach uh, and learn. Mm -hmm. And we also work on our own attitudes when mm -hmm. we see things. The policy space, mm -hmm. beyond creating a friendly environment for uh, the big production um, tickets to come here, mm -hmm. What can we do within the borders of Ghana? Many, 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 many things. Um, let me just, within the space of education, say that, you see, Nigeria has done a very good job. Nigeria has spread its culture so much, we don't even recognize it. When we go to parties these days, first of all, it's mainly Nigerian songs we play. The dressing, even the way we behave, the headgear, everything. I'm not saying it's negative, but don't let it happen on your blind side a couple of years ago the, the 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 culture minister of russia accused the united states of global dominance through netflix of global mind control through netflix why is that because they are, sh they are morphing you without you being aware mm. who are we impacting are we even aware if locally what we are consuming are we controlling it are we conscious are we aware of the impact how do we also see that as a tool? Culture, film, whatever, it's a cultural diplomacy tool. How do we use that as a way to engage the rest of the world? I mean, last year we got the DEN government to commit to show Ghana films in all Ghanaian embassies around the world. It never got to implementation stage. You go to our embassies globally and they're showing CNN. The fact is that if you don't tell your story, someone will tell it for you. We've had recent incidents where um, we complain about being reported into, in the international media front negatively or ways that we are not very happy with. What is our mud piece? What are we selling? So, I mean, there's opportunity for that. There's opportunity for news. Now we've gone digital. Uh, the bill has come out. Are we going to create jobs? There's a, there's a film bill. Um, we are going to create a film fund. All of those things. If more people are creating jobs, you know, more people are creating whatever, that will create jobs. You know, so they have, internally, there's so much that we can do. Let me just, I just came from a conference where apparently I learned that Nigeria has a policy. Where now on Nigerian television, 70% of the content has to be Nigerian. The other 20% has to be African. The 10% can be wherever. That is policy. And so immediately, opportunity for, for creating jobs is all over because now the TV stations or the networks don't have a choice but to collaborate and work with each other and create content locally. And so that's job creation. So instead of giving someone else, when you go and buy content, the Mexican soaps and everything that we buy, we are creating jobs for Mexicans. I mean, not that that's a bad thing, but could we use the opportunity to also empower uh, producers here? Those producers, when they know that they have channels where they can show their productions, then they can go to Dalex Finance maybe, and Dalex Finance will give them the money uh, to go and produce because they know that there's a there's a path to market and they would make their money back and so then you create a loop so the local producer is empowered he goes to the finance uh, organization he gets the money he brings the, the production to the media house the media house shows it job is created the media house also has content to show to people and we know that the content that is coming out is sanitized 
you know now we have not to i'm not using this platform to to criticize anyone but we have content that is foreign that is in local language i mean it's so confusing we have the skill sets here if we don't have the skill sets let's that's why we have to invite co-production so that the skills transfer then we are training our people there's no reason why we can't sell our productions out there mm. i am an example Presently, Silver Rain is on about four airlines. We are on Amazon. We are on Google Play. We are on Vimeo. We are everywhere. It was very difficult for us to get the financing to do this because there was no clear path to, 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 to market. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that we can do. I mean, as uh, for tourism, for culture, for the industry, and it extends. It's all interconnected, you know? So I don't know. <laughs> if you were to look at the impending digital terrestrial migration mm -hmm. for some it's presenting an opportunity because we now have a multiplicity of platforms mm -hmm. and channels for content but if you would look at the nascent nature of our mm -hmm. industry mm. is this a blessing or a potential curse for us well, I think it's a blessing. The reason being that, listen, the rest of the world is going in a certain direction and we cannot stand still. I mean, there's no phenomenon known as standing still. You're either moving forward or you're backwards, you know, because the ground moves by itself. So there's no standing still. What we have to do is like people who criticize social media or no, don't like social media. Mm -hmm. If you are an organization and you don't have a social media strategy, you might be leaving your audience behind because you want to meet your audience where they are and social media is it. So, I mean, that's just to show that the world is moving in a certain direction. Let's see it as an opportunity. Like I said, going digital means more content. It means competition, which is good. And so there are more media houses that may itself in itself can be a challenge. But why don't we look at more trade between African countries that will open up the market? So, for instance, um, I remember when we had this conference and I was saying to the Nigerian delegation that, listen, fine, 30% of the content uh, has or 20% has to come from Africa. Is there a way that Ghana can begin to work with Nigeria to try and fill in that gap? So, can we send a delegation to Nigeria and try and negotiate a deal where we supply them with content? What do we give them in return? You know, so digital, can we, there are many people that who are interested in our culture. I mean, when we had people come here for the festival, they went to, we, we did some of the viewings at Jamestown. The foreigners were more interested in going to Jamestown than in coming to the mall. You know, they went there, they ate the food, we took them to Kakum, they were excited. They said those were some of the best experiences they had. So for this year, for the festival, we are going to do a cultural immersion thing where we pick a particular um, uh, ethnic group and we kind of immerse into their culture, the games, the food, the, the paraphernalia, all of these things. So what will we be doing? We'll be creating jobs. We'll be exposing. People will be selling. That's our culture. We have beautiful stories. We have filmmakers who are always trying to copy other stories. When we have amazing stories our old stories haven't been told our our folklores haven't been told our daily lives haven't been told um so there's so much that we have that the rest of the world and it, remember you know i had a very unique experience last year i went to uh the benelani film festival there were about six no about 15 Ghanaians. Everyone identified as a foreigner. I was the only Ghanaian who identified as a Ghanaian. They all identified as coming from the U.S. because they don't live here. I could also say, I don't, you know, I don't live here. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a resident of another country. Mm. I could have said I live in that country, but I identified as a Ghanaian. And so these are, you know, th these are opportunities that we miss. When we were there... We had, because they felt alone. They didn't feel, feel like they were supported. South Africa was there with a table with 30 filmmakers paid for by the government, selling South Africa, signing treaties. We were not there. I was there as, my, and when I, every time my colleagues, the other Ghanaians, they were laughing at me because they would be, they would say, Ghanaian in there, you know, Ghanaian in there, because that's the Ghanaian going, and they would be laughing at me because I was the only one who identified as a Ghanaian. 
and it, and I remember at the time because the the deputy was my my very good friend, and I said, "Where is the Ghanaian delegation?" And then she was like, "Well, you are representing Ghana," <laughs> and we had a laugh uh, because there were she had some challenges as well. But these are all opportunities that we are missing, and the reason why. When I was there, they were interested in me as a Ghanaian. Is because I had a fresh voice. I had something they had not heard. Mm -hmm. They were interested in my story. And so you see that amongst all the Ghanaians, I was the one identified as Ghanaian that had the most attention because I had something that was unique. We have a story. We are a people. We have a culture that the rest of the world is interested in. Let's look at how we can package that culture and sell it. That's it communicate who you are what you are your value and then sell it and i think we are having challenges selling ghana even when we were looking for something to represent us as a festival and we put it out there when you think of ghana what do you think of what is our brand we don't even have that and that is simple so i think that we need to go back to the basics and kind of reconfigure and put the little things the detail we have to get it right. We certainly must get it right. And um, as we bring this uh, conversation to a close, um, I'd like to explore some of the other things that you do. Lately, you've been teaching. Uh, I've been teaching. Um, and, and what led you to the classroom? Well, I love teaching. I've always thought, interestingly, I used to run a school, uh, Ego Drama College. Uh, not many people know that. Uh, and, and we've trained quite a number of people in the industry doing well now, went through my, my school. Um, I did my national service at, uh, at, at uh, Accra Poly. I, I thought uh, human resource or something, I forget what I did. Um, and then, you know, I mentor at MIT, um, which is very interesting. Uh, mentoring is a little different from teaching because it's more of a relationship. Um, and as a mass communication person, when Webster approached me to, to teach uh, lecture mass communication, it was very interesting for me. And I got the opportunity. And I remember my final class last semester, I said to my class, I said, listen, don't say that you are just one person. You can make a big difference. It's about communication. Everything we've said here today is about communication. It's about packaging, speaking out, uh, letting the world know who you are, what you are, and just having a mouthpiece. And, and for me, the opportunity, and, and uh, quite a number of the people in the class were people who... Um, Website is a great university, by the way. So it were people. We had quite some a number of prominent people in the class, and for me, I, I see some of them using some of the things that were, we discussed in class already. So um, I love to teach. Wow. Mm. Now maybe about I would retire on that. On 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 teaching. On that teaching. would be very yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you did um, also prior to returning to 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 go into teaching mm -hmm. and to do the movie, you spent. Uh, some time at the uh, Kennedy uh, Center at right. Harvard College. Mm. Um, what was the attraction with Harvard? Well, I'm a very versatile, you know, I'm interested in politics. That's why I was so upset recently when there was a news article that said Juliet would never get into politics. Um, I said that, I, I never said that. It was actually on your channel. I never said that, and I think they did it as a way to get a, ha a headline. But I did politics in school, actually. I did public policy. I did public administration. So my training, I have a double master's in public policy and public administration. So... I'm very vocal on these things. I may not be practicing, but I'm very vocal. So one thing I say is that I'm certainly not um, a neutral person. I mean, I, I say my mind. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm jumping on a platform, uh, but I do uh, speak my mind. So yes, I've always been interested in, in that. I've always been interested in business. Uh, my, my, my business is business driven, you know. Even with the festival, which, is, which I'm the founding president of, is focused on the business of film. And so, yes, when I wanted to go back to school, interestingly, I did some courses from the Harvard Business School as well, but my main course was at the Harvard Kennedy School. And um, I remember there was this one time where we had the CEO of Starbucks come and speak with us. And before he came in, we are having a conversation of, of, of a certain situation and, and as an entrepreneur what would you do and people were using their textbook cases and I was the only one who sat there and said well if I was a CEO of Starbucks this is what I would do 
And when he came in and they asked him, that's exactly what he said. Um, for that class, the, 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 the business, um, uh, whatever that I did, um, is what actually I came and started Mobile Flix. Mobile Flix was what I did at school as my, my business uh, idea that I was going to pursue. So, you know, interestingly, there's a statistic that said that more people from the Kennedy Harvard School lead companies than people from the business, Harvard Business School, actually. So, you know, the attraction is multifold, just like what we were saying. As an individual, you have to develop different parts of your brains. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not um, a one-dimensional individual. I do multi-dimensional. And for me, the arts is, is the highest part of my dimension. What do you do to relax in all your multi-dimensional space and life? What are, Watch what are, music videos. Really? Yeah. What are you going to are you going to play videos? a music video on this show? <laughs> <laughs> we probably will for you. Well, wow, that's interesting. So you just relax in front of the TV. I mean, music videos, videos. That's where you break all the rules, right? I'm an artist, and within film, there's a certain structure. Music video is where you don't have to follow any structure. You don't have to make sense, quote unquote. You just have to be creative if you can connect the dots. So I just like to sit there and just see people being creative um, and breaking all the rules. You know, one of the lessons I learned in school is that you learn the rules and then you break them. And I think that music video directors are best at breaking rules. And I love to break rules. So I learned a thing or two from that. Um, I write a lot, and, and, and the film Silver Rain, we are uh, turning it into a novel as well. Um, it will come out this year. So I write a lot. I listen to music video. I watch films, not as much mm -hmm. um, as I should because I get critical along the way. Uh, so those are the main things that I, I do for fun. And then I love to dance. Oh, mm. good. All right. Well, guess what? Mm. We might just go dancing <laughs> very soon. Well, Julie, right. thank you so much uh, for making time. Uh, thank you. Joining us on the Executive Lounge. Um, five things I always take away from the conversation. So mm. for me is one, that no matter what life throws at you, consistently go into that place in your mind and see yourself doing better than before and eventually you'll be able to do that. And also, uh, stand for something. Uh, be vocal about it. And uh, learn from your failures. And um, also, so that makes three. And then the fourth thing is that um, always believe that you can do more. Um, and, and you've demonstrated that in the work that you've done and um, in thinking big about the festival and all the other things that you've done. The final, final thing is resilience. Thank you. And um, it's been fantastic uh, having you on the show. Can I add a sixth thing? Yes. Dance. Yes. Okay. After you've done it all, make sure that you dance. It's been wonderful having you on this edition of the Executive Lounge. And as always, go forward, make rain. We'll be back with more.